What up, though? It's Dewan Dandridge, CEO of Black Leads Detroit, and we're coming to you live from BLD headquarters with another episode of Speak for Yourself. Of course, we have the one and only Ken Elkins, a.k.a. Saginaw Austin's <laughs> finest. <laughs> What's happening? What's happening? <laughs> and a very special guest, a dear friend of mine, most of y'all probably already know him, Jason Wilson. Shalom. So, Jason, what we like to do is allow our guests to kind of introduce themselves. You know how you go and do speaking tours and they be like Uh reading off your resume, be like, he did this, that, and the other. (laughs) What what would you, how would you introduce yourself if you were introducing Jason Wilson? It'd be real short, man. Just (laughs) a, what would you say? Just a servant of the Most High, uh, doing my best to walk in his will. You know, if I look at titles, I would say CEO of the nonprofit, the union. And the director of the Cave of Adelum Transformational Training Academy. What's up? Yeah. Husband to Nicole. Your husband to Nicole. Father, father to Alexis. Yeah, and Jason, author. Uh, I guess public speaker, you know. See how we so, put the pressure on right. the yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, say Champion for mental health. Yeah, for uh, sure. Champion for mental health, the documentary. I'm not a documentarian. Oh, that would yeah. be the director. Okay. Uh, but I guess just uh, not an actor because it, was, it wasn't scripted, so... Yeah. I don't know what I would, how would you title that one, but yeah, I'm proud to have a documentary on the work that yeah. we're doing in the cave of Adela. That's what's up. Yeah, that Very was. important work. Yes. Very important work. Ken, you want to fire off with the first question for Jason? I got a list of them. Uh, uh, let's start with what he was talking about, the documentary. I mean, uh, talk about that. I mean, that is that is amazing Yeah. Um, to highlight your work. So let's talk about that. Yeah, that came about in uh, 2016 when our first video went viral. Uh, I got contacted by like three Hollywood producers and I really turned all of them down because I didn't want the caves mission to be tainted, you know? Mm. Um, but they all wanted to do a docu-series on the cave of Adullam. And one of them, um, I really took a liking to his name is Roy Bank. Uh, very patient, kind. It was like, Hey man, you know, you let me know if you, you really want to do it. But I think this message should be seen across the world. Um, fast forward to 2018 um, actually, I, no, I'm sorry, later that year in 2016, the TV show This Is Us used our father-son initiation. And prior to that, I wasn't going to do a documentary or docuseries. But when I saw, like, man, what we did so sacred on this screen, I was in my uh, garage crying because I was so angry. And why were you angry? Because they didn't, they didn't ask for permission. You know, they oh, used right. it. They were inspired by right. it. Right. But um, they didn't, uh, we, we weren't notified. Okay. And so, um, but they made it right, you know, moving forward. But at that time, Most High, he was like, if you don't put it out, someone else will. Mm. So it hurt in that moment, but it was needed to happen because I wasn't going to sign to do the documentary. And so when I did the documentary, well, I signed, signed with Banker Studios, which is Roy Bank uh, Film Company, and then Lawrence Fishburne saw the sizzle reel, which is like the promo reel in 2018. And then he said, look, we got to get this out. Mm. And so that's when we all linked up together. And then we finished recording the documentary in 2019 in December, mm. right before the pandemic. Yeah. One of the producers, Helen Suglin, she was like, let's go ahead and knock it out the last month. And thankfully, you know, she did because we were shut down for two shut years. Shut down, right. yeah. yeah. So that's so how all that came about. Hearing you talk about, like, turning the opportunities down, one of the things that I think I appreciate is how much you protect mm-hmm. um, the, the cave. But I think because it's, like, individuals that are tied to families and, like, young men, but the way that you protect them, I, I can remember when – um, the producers were there and you had the parents um, have a conversation with the producers to make sure that the parents were going to be comfortable yes. with everything. Can you talk about where you're often coming from? Because mm-hmm. there's, there's a part of me that does this. It's like, like, damn, Jason, what you doing? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, like <laughs> more people need to see it. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Um, but there's also a part of me that really respects it because, of course, one of my children, my son, yes. was in the cave. Yes. So um, I, I really appreciate the balance. So like, but I'm like, on the one hand, you're going viral, mm-hmm. but on the other hand, like you're really protective. So can you talk a little bit about like where your, 
mm. where you're coming from with that and, and the why. Yeah, it, well, it was, as far as with the parents, it was imperative. We were like a village, you know. Yes. You guys were there when, you know, I first started outside of schools, you know, because at first mm -hmm. the cave started, we were in schools, mm -hmm. and then I had to pull it out of schools um, because I wanted to, you know, incorporate more biblical principles. And it, it was more powerful when we did. And so when I had the first group of fathers and families, we were all in it together, you know. And so when this opportunity arose, I'm like, well, I got to make sure the families or the tribe is okay with this decision. And so um, they were, y'all were nicer to the, the, the producers and directors than me. They were grilling me. <laughs> <laughs> then when they came, I'm like, oh, they, they're done. And they was like, yeah, we, we're, we're, we're good. We're good. Because I didn't know what to expect, yeah. but... As far as like not um, eagerly like jumping at every opportunity, um, I never desire to be seen for what I do. You know, I'd rather just do it. You know, um, I often say if the microphone was a plow in the black community, it'd be a lot of work done. Mm -hmm. It's more talking than if we applied as much as we do far as talking to action, to labor, we have a lot done. And so I, I don't really care about the accolades being seen. Um, Literally, I was just about to walk away from the documentary because what mattered was me doing the work, mm. not the documentary. Yeah. And so I always keep that in front of me. And But to the flip side, I understand that's something personal in me. Um, you got ch childhood trauma, you know, makes you shy away from certain things that remind you of a pain. And you not have to pray on it and say, okay, you know, God, is this something you want me to do? And yeah. typically, what he asks us to do biblically it's never really what we want to do. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Something so uncomfortable, something it's very uncomfortable, yeah. something you're going to need a lot of faith, and it's going to stretch you. And so I choose to take that route than to um, just have it easy and comfortable because I know in the end, if I don't deal with my emotions, my fears, and insecurities, when I get older and I don't have the filters anymore in my brain, it's going to really come out, and I don't want my children to have to suffer with what I had to when my mother had dementia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so... Talk, let, let's talk a little bit about that, mm -hmm. right? Um, like, I got a chance to see you care for your mother, mm -hmm. like, from the time when you and Nicole purchased a new home for the purpose of being able to bring your mom to your home. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then when it didn't plan out that way and y'all had to make some changes, um, talk a little bit about about that and the some of the, the biggest things that you learned from that and how it helps you help so many today. Well, that experience, yeah, you were right there. When we bought the house, you were there with me at night working, you know, yeah. working on that yeah. house. And um, that was a very um, heart-rending time for me because here it is, you know, the first love of you know a son's life is the mother. So here it is, I'm losing her mentally, but she's still there physically. And you buy this house, you expect your mother to move in with you. And my wife is just as excited, you know, to have that support from your wife. Which is huge. Yeah, it's major. Yeah. And then she has an episode where she just like a state of paranoia mm. and couldn't come back. Mm. And then the doctor was like, look, she needs 24-hour care. If you can't provide it, you need to find someone who can. And so, man, in the middle of the cave, middle of developing the union, everything, I had the most heaviest burden ever in my life on my shoulders. Mm. And um, it, it taught me so much, but the main thing was, well, it's two things. Um, it helped me overcome anxiety to the point where, like I feel anxiety sometimes, and sometimes pressure still to this day. But it was a point in my life, man, where I was shaken by anxiety, mm. like anything, you know. But when I realized, like, wait a minute, you know, I can't control this. This is literally out of my hands. Mm -hmm. I would get a call at 2 in the morning, and I have to go uh, over to the lady's house who was taking care of my mom and two other women, three other women, and calm her down. So what God was doing, he was stilling my soul, but he was getting me ready for that viral video when that happened because I don't think I could have handled that moment and where I am today if I hadn't experienced all of what I did with my mother caring for her. And, and then another thing was I stopped being a, just a masculine male, you know, the peace provider, protector, you know, the man who only can exude uh, protection, strength, uh, aggression, and providing. I had to become a nurturer. Mm -hmm. 
I, I never would have done any woman's nails, you know. But I would do my mother's uh, sand uh, file. I said sand, that's the construction. <laughs> but I would uh, file and cut her fingernails, you know, mm -hmm. uh, massage her scalp, put lotion on her feet, you know, these things. I had to become a tender man, you know. I had to become more than just masculine, become human. And that allowed the boys to see a different side in me. And what's interesting, if you look at when the K first started, the pictures with me and my students, we all were serious looking. Yeah. But when I started showing a different side of myself, I became more comprehensive as a man. That's when my boys started releasing, dropping their guards. Mm -hmm. Then you started seeing healing in the K. Yeah. At first, everyone's trying to be tough. Yeah. But then they said, well, wait a minute. I still need to be that lion, but I can be the lamb as well. And and my mother, you know, I, I said in the documentary, she was my sensei. I had a lot of great martial art teachers, but none of them really taught me how to really control my emotions and master them and in a real life way and then become a comprehensive man, you know. And so I credit her for that. You know, I, I thank, praise the most high for that experience, even though during it, you know, I was like, I would pray that he would take her life because it was, I saw her suffering. Mm -hmm. And he said one day, he says, Jason, that's not love, that's fear. Mm -hmm. And one day when she had a, uh, matter of fact, it was during the cave, she had a stroke. And the kids gathered and prayed over me. Yeah. Mm. And then when I went to the hospital, I prayed for him to keep her. I didn't want her to go. He says, that's love. Mm. You know, and so when I got past that, you know, uh, it made me a better man. It did, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Let's talk about the cave a little bit more, especially for those who may not know yes. what the cave is. So talk about that, um, what's provided to the young folk uh, mm -hmm. and to the adults as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Cave of Adullam is a transformational training academy uh, based in Detroit, Michigan. Um, historically, it came from the story of David in the Bible. Uh, David and Goliath, you know, everyone should know, even if you're not a, a Christian. Um, David, after he beat the Goliath, uh, King Saul, who he served, was jealous of him because the women were singing about him killing more men than King Saul. And his jealousy... Uh, made him attempt to kill David, and David had to flee for his life to this cave mm -hmm. in the Dullam. And the story goes that there was 400 men who came unto David who was distressed, discontented, and in debt, and he became their captain. And what I pondered that most pastors hadn't was what happened in that cave that made these 400 men who were distressed, in debt, and discontented to come out and be labeled as mighty men of valor. And so when I studied a little more, I found out that that, that cave was also called Justice of the People. That's what the Dullam meant, that's the city. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't just a random cave that David and Lot and others had fled to. And many believe he talked about, um, I can't think of the other prophet's name, but there was always a place where people go to the cave for refuge. So here was a safe space for men, even better than a, a man cave, mm -hmm. a little safe space, a refuge. And so I created that for the boys in the Cave of Adullam here in Detroit. It started off as just only martial arts fighting. Mm -hmm. But then I quickly realized they didn't need more discipline. They needed more love. So when I started mm. having the boys talk out what they've been I'm dealing sorry. with. yeah, You got to say that part one more time. I'm so yeah, sorry. I, I discovered yeah. that our boys didn't need more discipline. They needed more love. Yeah. And, you know, boot camps were out. You know, yeah. uh, scare straight programs were out. I participated in at least two. And I'm like, wait a minute, how are you going to help a, a young boy overcome trauma by re-traumatizing him? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and yeah. so right now, you, yeah. you, you're hard-pressed to find any. Yeah. When I gave the boys in Highland Park, because that was my pilot uh, program for the cave, an opportunity just to be human, hmm. to express their fears and, and their insecurities, man, all of them graduated on time, but it was four I was really proud of because they were in danger of not graduating in eighth grade. And that's within, I think it was 16 or 24 week module. They all graduated. And uh, one of them is James. He went from a 0 0.8 GPA to 2.3, I believe. Yeah. And it all was attributed to just giving them a opportunity to release what's going on inside so of them. So not tutoring. No, yeah, actually, you know, right now, uh, I think it's 78% of our recruits improve their grade point average by one letter grade without tutoring. Hmm. Mm. And so, you know, that's just more confirmation on what we do is really working. And, and I just, our mission is to teach, train, and transform uninitiated boys, boys who okay. haven't been drawn upon, hey, am, let me help you walk into this manhood, you know, what it looks like, uh, into comprehensive men of the most high, men who are physically conscious, 
uh, mentally astute and spiritually strong enough to navigate through the pressures of the world, this world, without succumbing to their emotions. So when you help a boy do that, he stays out of trouble, he stays focused in school, more obedient to his parents, uh, 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 community servants, because we make him do community service as well now mm-hmm. in the rite of passage. So it's, it's a comprehensive way. Uh, nothing new is under the sun. We know that a rite of passage or initiation goes thousands of years back, and yeah. but it needed to be reborn again because our boys are in need. And then you have grown men who have broken boys inside. And that's why you have so many grown men still in basements because they never mm-hmm. were initiated mm-hmm. into manhood. They never had a public um, ceremony for them to denounce manhood. Yeah. I mean, not manhood, but boyhood. Oh, yeah. 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 Deeply Rooted Produce is Detroit's first zero-waste mobile grocery store where they bring the health home to you through home delivery, subscription services, and farm development assistance. They supply pantries, schools, and wellness centers with much-needed fresh, locally grown produce from black farmers and gardeners all over the country. Subscribe to one of their subscription services for as low as $100 a month. That's only $25 a week, and they accept bridge cards and other government incentives. You get access to local produce, local meats, seafood, dairy, and cheese. Deeply Rooted Produce wants you to know that there's a story behind the food that you eat, and they are here to tell it. Subscribe today at DeeplyRootedProduce.com. Ken tapped into it in his question without even like necessarily maybe knowing, and then you're talking, I think you're, you're kind of going into it now. <clears throat> Part of his question was to the, the young men and that are signed up to the cave, but also some of the fathers, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So how your because what you just described, right? Like the not needing needing more discipline, needing more love. Like the generation of men that were our coaches and whatnot, they didn't know that, None right? And, and how could they, right? Like nobody taught them, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So they were just giving us like hats off to them because. You know, they were just two generations away from slavery. Man. Yeah, so they... But they were committed, yeah, right? Yeah, and like, they didn't they have an opportunity to, to do this. They, yeah. Those, those yeah, coaches yeah, would show yeah, up yeah. every day. Yes, you know they what would. Mean? Yes, they would. But they didn't. They weren't gentle at mm-hmm. all. You know what I mean? They weren't like, comprehensive in their approach. They weren't comprehensive in no, their approach, you know? Yeah. Um, trying to pass on, like, love and responsibility the best way that they knew Absolutely. how. So my hat still goes off to them. Mm-hmm. But... I also think about some of the things that, uh, if I would sit there through a course, some things I would hear you say that would be challenging, right? Like there's one lesson in particular. And I can remember having a confrontation with somebody and um, uh, one of your lessons like, came to mind and it probably kept me from either <laughs> getting hurt or hurting someone. Right. And someone had like issued a threat toward me. But I remember one of your lessons when you would hold a stick or shaft at a, uh, a distance and you would say, you might be this close. And you say, I'm not a threat now, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But then when you get close enough, mm-hmm. you're like, now I'm a threat. Now you have to deal with me. Right. And the confrontation that I had with this individual, the way I was trained, if they issued a threat, like... You don't give them a chance to do anything more, but that in, in that moment, that lesson came back to me and again yeah. probably kept me. So talk a little bit about some of what you've seen um, spill over mm. to some of the fathers and maybe even some people that you connect with now that have read your book mm. or have seen the documentary. I mean, um, we see the fruit in the boys, but I get stopped a lot by men. Um, what blows my mind is when I'm stopped by men of different ethnicities. I was in the gym one time working out, and a guy from Romania came up. His eyes were bloodshot red, and I could tell he was a wrestler because I know the bill and, you know, the ears, you know, the Colour cauliflower flowers. ears. And he comes over to me, and I'm like, man, is this brother angry? You know, what's going on? Right. But he was fighting back tears. Mm. And he said, uh, he heard me on Joe Rogan, and he said that interview changed his life, and then he said my book saved his life. Mm. And... That right there, and he just hugged me, and he was about to break down crying, and he said, I, I got to go, and walked away. 
I get that a lot just yeah. to hear men. Should have grabbed him and said, "Cry like a man." Yeah, yeah. Go on and cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 well, I, I should have. You know, I mean, yeah. in hindsight, I should have, because it let men it's, let it, let men know it's okay to cry. I yeah. mean, I was at Procter and Gamble. I was talking about uh, the young guys who don't look like they need love. They're the ones who need it. Mm-hmm. And a brother come up to me. He was a scientist. Mm-hmm. Long uh, dreadlocks, tattoos on his arm, uh, one on his neck. He says, that was me. I needed a hug. Cause I said, what a thug was, I made an acronym. It was a traumatized human unable to grieve. Mm. And I didn't realize that until I got older. Mm. And when he said, yeah, I was one of those guys I needed a hug, I said, well, give me a hug then. Mm. And I hugged him. And we hugged. He, he didn't want to let me go for a minute. Mm. And he needed that. And so mm. to see men uh, not only, you know, like, Man, I like what he's saying, but embrace it, and you see their lives changing. And because really, we all want to live from the good in our hearts, but it's the fear of being condemned or impassively dismissed when we're vulnerable. Yeah. And it's like, okay, I'll never do that again. You know, uh, I remember one time, and I tell men this all the time. They say, "Well, what if uh, I show myself to a woman? You know, show her the real me, and then you know she takes advantage of it." I say, "That's a blessing." Now you know you got the wrong person in your life. Hmm. And with my wife, when I first started breaking free from emotional incarceration, we were in a car uh, at the park, uh, parking lot of Kroger's, and she was like, I never met a man so emotional in my life, you know? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> and at that moment, I was like, and you never will ever again. I'm about to go back to where I was. Yeah. And I was oh. a bad father, not bad father, I was disciplined dad. Mm. Wasn't compassionate, patient enough with my daughter. Mm. Hard, you know, dropping the hammer for everything. Uh, unresolved anger, even with my wife, Nicole, we just yelled in the house a lot. And at that moment, I said, you know what? No, I'm not going back. If you don't accept it, that's your problem. You're going to lose a good husband. Mm-hmm. And I did it for me. And I tell men, you know, when, you, when you're breaking free from emotional incarceration, you're trying to heal and become whole, mm-hmm. do it for yourself. Because if you do it for someone else and they don't acknowledge it, yeah. you're going to get mad and you're going to digress even worse than where you were. And so, and hats off to Nicole and the women who's supporting these men who are breaking free because, you know, we not only have to unlearn what a man is, they have to unlearn as well. Yes. So here yes. as a woman, you've been literally conditioned, right. this is the type of man you need. Yeah. But women now are realizing this isn't the type of man I want. Yeah. You know, because, yeah, you know, what good is it to find out what your husband was dealing with when you're planning his funeral? Yeah. And so they're tired of that. They want their men to break free. But, you know, as men, we have to give our wives grace as well because – you know, to hear uh, say of her husband say, babe, I, I'm having suicidal thoughts. For a woman who hasn't totally breaking free from what I call the masculine mandate, that a man is only the provider, that's terrifying for her. Because yeah. that means like, yo, especially if he's the breadwinner, man, you, you, you're considering killing yourself? Yeah. Now she's shaking. Yeah. So I tell men all the time, make sure, you know, I love the scripture, the Bible says, iron sharpens iron, so as one man sharpens another. The Hebrew for that word man is literally male. So we're supposed to sh- you know, sharpen each other and challenge each other and encourage each other. We have to be careful when we drop heavy things on our wife. In my book, Battle Cry, and our wives, I, I write about in Battle Cry the huddle principle. Mm-hmm. And I use the example of Tom Brady when they were getting beat down by Atlanta uh, Falcons in the Super Bowl. What if he would have went to the huddle to his team? And here's the team captain, and he would have went to the huddle like, hey, we're we going to lose, dude. I'm tired. My body's hurting. I got enough rings. Let's try this next year. Mm-hmm. He would have demoralized the whole team. Yeah. So as husbands, we want to be the leaders. We want to be the king, the priest. We got to act like it sometimes and know what we need to share, not only, you know, to uh, be transparent, but sometimes you got to share to win. You know, it's like I can't, even right now, I can't tell my wife everything that I'm thinking because yeah. she would worry But because I know she loves me. But when you can get to the place which then when she gets strong enough and she said, hey, I'm ready to hear that, and you can drop it on her, the key then is that uh, do we have the capacity now for our wives to drop heaviness on us? Mm -hmm. Because they've been holding so much inside, especially our black women. You know, I've been uh, really sharing a lot online about it, and it's amazing. Our women, you don't see too many black women cry anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's a major issue. You know, and then and then I'm telling you, I spoke for DPSCD, white women, Mexican, different ethnicity, they all agree. But why are women, why aren't they crying anymore? When our women lose empathy, that's when it's over. Mm-hmm. And so as men, we have to not only get healed and become whole for us, 
But we need to desire to increase our capacity so that our wives can finally, you know, let their guard down yeah. and talk about their trauma, their fears, their failures, their insecurities. Yeah. You know, and, and only way we can do that, man, is to become more comprehensive where yeah. if we just stay the eight crayon box versus the 64, the 64 crayon box, if that's all the emotions that God has given us and a woman is used to expressing those, and you only got eight. I say three because we only want three out of the eight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she needs an orange, and we only got blue, green, and black. Yeah. We're in trouble. Yeah. yeah. So that's the goal is uh, for men to embrace uh, not only their fears, but to express and release them, man. You become whole. You know, my marriage is, I mean, 100% better. You know all the stuff me and Nicole went through and uh, about to get separated in 2015. And... Uh, we realize we built the marriage on our desires instead of God's. And when we put his first and then say, wait a minute, Jay, I need to listen to your heart. Instead of just hearing what you say, I need to really hear your heart. And then I started hearing Nicole's heart. Yeah, that's huge. And it changed the that's game. Huge. Yeah, that's man. Huge. So as a man, when you can express yourself yeah. without yelling or hitting the refrigerator like I, I did, yeah. you know, uh, when I can just articulate, hey, babe, that hurt me. You don't trust me with the finances? Now, instead of me yelling, that's automatically going to bring my wife's guard up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I'm talking and communicating mm -hmm. at a level where she's used to, it's like, hey, this is dialogue. Mm -hmm. She can drop her guard and receive it, and then we can, we can heal and move forward. Yeah, it's, it's rough. It's rough. It's like <clears throat> I think about – so there's one moment in Cry Like a Man that, like, broke me down. Mm -hmm. And I know that I deal with what you, like, coined the, – the phrase you coined – Emotional incarceration, mm -hmm. emotional incarceration, right? Um, when you and Nicole were on the plane mm -hmm. and y'all had just had a big falling out yeah. and uh, sh she scrolls your hand, right? right? Yeah. Like knowing y'all both, just seeing it. And I mean, I, I know I, when I came along, I know that y'all were going through some mm -hmm. of the rebuilding, right? Yes. And just thinking about her sending that message just in a squeeze of hand. When y'all both upset with each other, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But just kind of like that, I, I, I took that as ain't nobody going nowhere. Yeah. Like we in this together. And that broke me down, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, huh. yeah, that was beautiful. But I think what you're talking about is kind of one of my favorite terms and favorite things to go after, and it's, free, uh, it's freedom, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You think about the journey for those that have been incarcerated mm -hmm. in bondage of some sort. Like, freedom is scary. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, there's yeah. serious issue with recidivism, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we had people that, during biblical times, yeah. that struggled mm -hmm. with like what freedom was looking yeah, like. Yes, yes. We had people who struggled with, like sh like share cropping was a real thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because it's scary. Yeah. And as, as somebody that has dealt with what you're trying to help folks break free from, it's scary sometimes, right? Like those, sharing those emotions are, are, are normal to me. It's second nature. I have mm -hmm. that stuff mastered. Mm -hmm. That other stuff that you be talking about, mm -hmm. It's scary. Yeah, I mean, you. I mean, we rather jump in front of bullets for our family yeah. than to really share what's really yeah. going on inside yeah. of us. And it's understandable. I mean, the last thing we want to be called is weak and soft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's like a dagger in the heart for a yeah. man, you yeah. know. And so, but again, once you realize, like, wait a minute, I know what that jail cell looks like. I know it's no peace in there. I know it's not a safe space. It's depression in there. It's sorrow. Mm -hmm. It's self-condemnation. It's suicidal thoughts in that cell. And that's why I tell men, you know, when you get up off of that bed in your jail cell or emotional incarceration, step in, take one step and stay there for a moment. Don't try to run out because then you're going to get shot and run right back. Embrace that one step. Stay in it. Be graceful. Then take the next. Then stay in that step. What does that step look like? We're so quick to you know, try to find books, uh, the eight steps to this and the nine yeah. steps. Yeah. It's like, dude, I tell the people there is no point of arrival. It's constant working and evolving until we're in the grave. Yeah. And when you have that set before, you understand like, hey, I can make a mistake as long as I, if it's, if it's to me, if it's sin, I repent. If it's against you as my brothers, I apologize and reconcile and keep moving. If it's against my wife, I apologize, ask her to forgive me, and we reset. 
um, when you give yourself enough grace to make a mistake, then you can really become better as a man, especially what we do as far as community leadership. It seems like every day is trial and error. You, we're trying to <laughs> figure out what's going on, you know, and it's easy to say, man, I, I, I don't have it right. I, I, mean, I, could, I could probably just do something else. This is too hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, and it's, 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 it comes a place where you'd be like, wait a minute, who's done what we've done? Yeah. And that's what I have to look at, you know, and that keeps me going. And then more so is like if I stop, will things change? And that's even bigger, you know, what type of footprint am I going to leave for my children to see, the community to see? And that's why I don't want to leave. You know, I get offered opportunities. I'm like, well, if you film here, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, why we have to leave? They got film studios all around yeah. here. Yeah. And so that's that's really big for me. And But that comes because I know who I am. You know, I don't, my worth isn't in my work. Yeah. And so once I found what I was, who I really am as a man, who I really am to Nicole and my children, and most importantly, who I am to the Most High. The accolades, the, the awards, all that other stuff, it shifts with the slightest breeze, man. And so I don't, I don't hold no weight in it. And so because of that, I'm able to say, well, no, that's not good on my terms because this is who I am. That's good, man. Yeah. That's good. I got one more question, but I want to. Yeah, well. Just well, with the weakness <clears throat> part, when we talk about that, I remember, I've talked about this on this show once before. So I remember when I was going through some things and on our first bike ride for equity, mm -hmm. you and I was riding next yeah. to each other and God just put you right next to me because you just started talking about crying. I don't even where we, why? I don't even know just, how that started. Yeah, yeah it we just happened. Did, yeah. But it happened yeah. because I needed to hear it. Mm -hmm. Like, that's why it happened. Like, I'm like, why are we talking about this? But it just, it just happened. We talked about it. And then it's crazy how God works because then you was like, all right, I gotta go, and then you and you you got because you had to go and you left, and so then I had the rest of the ride. He ain't want to finish that ride with us. That's what it was. <laughs> That's what but we ain't gonna go there. Uh, we ain't gonna go, go there. Exactly. <laughs> but y'all rode right by my house. Dude. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, we were by the house. I'm in the crib. I'm going. Yo, uh, like, your house is gonna be there when we got done. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember you took off, and I then had the rest of the ride by myself to think about what you had just planted in my head, mm -hmm. and then um and at the time. I could ride by myself and I actually cried mm. the rest of the trip. And you was talking to me about the importance of crying as a man and how we, how we're taught not to do that, mm -hmm. but how we should do that. So like, it was the first time I've really cried like that, like mm -hmm. by myself yeah. reflected on what I was going through and was honest with myself. Right. And I was like, wow. And I, I thank God for putting you next to me. Cause I don't know what would have happened after that day, if I just kept holding it inside, right? Mm -hmm. So just talk about the importance of that, mm -hmm. like what you share with me, the importance of, of crying like yes. a man. Yeah, you know, what's deep is um, I was doing some research when I was writing Cry Like a Man, and I came across a biochemist uh, by the name of Dr. William Frey. And he's often referred to as the tear, tear expert, or the mm -hmm. tear, yeah, tear expert. He discovered that, you know, crying uh, from emotional uh, trauma or pain now, the tears not only contain 98% water, but also stress hormones. Mm. And, you know, so when we actually cry from trauma or grief or when we're at a funeral, that's typically why you feel better after you cry. Mm. But the more we repress it or suppress it, it feels like it's getting worse and worse and worse. Then we're drinking and doing other things, trying to suppress that pain. But God's way of grieving for a man is to cry and release it. And so here it is, society says, you know, uh, no pain, no gain, or you know, big boys don't cry. Mm -hmm. You literally have told a boy and a man to cut off his humanity. Mm -hmm. Told him you can only be strong. Man up, don't open up. Yeah. And so, and if you look, we die by suicide three times as likely as women. Nine out of 10 people who live to be over 100 are women. And I believe we commit 90% of homicides in this country. Yeah. You know, and, and psychotherapists, you know, they, they, they believe it's because we suppress everything inside of us. Our women go through stress. Our women have childhood trauma, anxiety, fears, suicidal thoughts. What's the difference? Mm -hmm. yeah, we, we've been conditioned to just buy into uh, a cultural mandate of what a man is. Our women didn't do it. They, in the early 1900s, they were told uh, a woman's place is in the kitchen. They bucked back against that. But we allow the culture to define us, and you see why so many of us are mentally unstable right now. Yeah. Yeah, because we're not really human, we're just masculine. And so, or we're operating in masculine attributes. And so once we just locked into a provider and protector, 
you know, your life is limited. You're done then. You just allow someone to define something that God created to be able to do all things. Mm. You know, and so now you're limited. You yeah. can't be, as a believer, how are you going to be all things through Christ when you only be a protector and provider? What happens when he needs you to be a nurturer, a comforter, have a long suffering? Yeah. You're done. And so, and that's why many men walk around living unfulfilled lives. We have things we don't have purpose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. My last question, and we got to get you up out of here because you got to go. Oh, I go teach, yeah. You got to <laughs> yeah. go teach today. Yeah. Um, it's obvious we have many testimonies of, like, the way that you and your gifts have shown up mm -hmm. and have benefited so many others. But with the young men that have come through the cave, can you talk about how they have served you? what you've learned from them or like how important they are in your life and what, what that looks like. Um, I was just talking about that with someone. Um, you should never feel you're too old to learn. Um, I learn from the boys every time I teach. They actually teach me how to teach them and they don't even know it. Um, I've learned how to communicate with patience, love, compassion, um, to look past the emotion of the moment, the anger, the frustration. You know how they can get, I mean, if you got a kid with a mother wound and he's failing at a technique we're trying to do, he gets angry, then he shuts down. Where I came up, we would just dog check him, yell him, or tell everybody to rush such and such, beat him down until he want to act right. Hmm. It didn't work, though. So those boys taught me how to really live from where I desire, the good in my heart. And it really stretched me. And it, it made me uh, the man I am, really, man. I mean, to teach six-year-olds when we first started, to be able to teach at their level and then to hear their thoughts and their anxieties, their fears and their comments, their ideas, and then to be able to help bring that to fruition and to see them and watch them grow. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's definitely not a one-way street. I may teach them some things, but they teach me how to teach them. And then even coming back now, we got one, two, three peer instructors who come back to help teach, which is really great. Uh, you know, one of the blessings. Darius stopped by my house last did? night. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. yeah, that's a good good guy. Yeah. Um, and uh, But just for them to say, can I take you out to eat? Mm. You know, that that blesses me. Like, like man, you know, because like, they're young. I'm like, Where you, yeah. how you got no money to take right. me out to eat? I'm <laughs> right, always right, saying right, that. Right, right. <laughs> but for them, and I want to treat them, but – God is like, let them yeah. do that. You know, they, yeah. they want to. And so that's that's major for me is just to see. And, and, and I guess the last thing is to see them uh, do well in school, in life, at home. When you start getting those praise reports from their parents, mm -hmm. I know in a cave you're going to handle your business because we don't tolerate it. Mm -hmm. Let's see how you handle it when you we ain't watching you. Mm -hmm. That's what it's for. When you get pulled over by a police officer, can you – Check your emotions. Why are you nervous and you ain't do nothing? Do you have the uh, wherewithal to know if you're in a store and you see guys who appear to seem like they want to start something with you? Will you leave what you want there and go to another store? Or do you feel like you just got to be tough and go through the process? And, and, and when I see guys and my students make it through that or young Josiah, Steve Cato's son, when the kid was bullying him, and we taught Josiah first that it's okay to protect himself. And then two, gave him the confidence and then some self-defense technique. When he threw that one bully, and he didn't brag about beating the bully and slamming him to the ground. He bragged about not allowing the bully's head to hit the ground. Mm. He said, Sharab, I held his hoodie so his head wouldn't hit the ground. And we applauded that. Yeah. So it lets me know they got it. And that's, that's really big. That, that's... You know, uh, my instructor would always say, uh, one of my martial arts instructors, he would say, if the students didn't learn, the teacher didn't teach. And so I hold myself to that standard. If I don't see the fruit, uh, I'm not watering the seeds. And so, yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Well, we're not going to hold you. Before we go, I want to commend both of you, especially you, my brother, for what you're doing. Um, Heck, I started us riding bikes. You done ran with it. Am I correct, <laughs> didn't I? You did. Yeah, yeah, he said yeah, that the other yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. He said, he told yeah. me that story the other day. He said, Jason started me riding the bike. Riding and the Jason bike. don't be riding the bike. <laughs> they left me out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, no, that, and that's you, my you, giveaway. You let me ride your You let me use like, 
Cause I had I would have Target special. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. what yeah. your bike was like yeah. seventy two pounds, <laughs> and it was a BMX. We was at the institute, right? <laughs> like, Do you can have fun like, on that. He yeah. was like, "Hey, ride this," and he let me ride, get on his bike, and I was like, "Yeah, this is a different experience. <laughs> this, is a, this is a different, whole different piece right, of right. machinery yeah, here." Right. Yeah. And um, you know, he ain't let you come ride the new one he got though. I'm I'm gonna let yeah, I'm gonna <laughs> because he loves to turn you out. <laughs> That's what it is. Like he he goes to get this like these nice toys, you know, and then he he be like, "Hey, come come check this out." So yeah. he, so yeah. now you can have somebody go hang out with him. Yeah, when, when you ride it, it's it's, uh, it's it's a game changer. But yeah, I'm proud of you, man. This is thank you to see this vision turn into what it is. Yeah. It's amazing, man. Then in your heart condition, like so many things, was like you shouldn't do it. This is too much, and you yeah. still went through it. And I remember we was getting mad at you because you never wanted the surgery. And uh, I'm like, dude, you got to make a decision. Because this was done, especially Tay, he was like, oh, the one in hospital again. <laughs> again. Yeah. And uh, that yeah. one time you almost left here, you know, that, that really. I checked out. Yeah. I tell yeah, you, I had yeah. the flat line. Yeah, that yeah. check, that, that really, yeah. that shook Tay. Yeah. And we were just like, you know, and I'm glad, you know, you made the best decision, you know, f- not only for you, but for your family, you know. and. Yeah. I commend you for that, and I believe God honored that, that, bro, because, you know, without that assistance there, you know what I mean? We don't know, dude, you know what I mean? But thank you for following, you know, uh, the vision he gave you, and uh, thank you for blessing us, actually, with a grant. It was your first year, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and so Mm -hmm. uh, you guys are doing a great job, man. It's really, it's commendable, and it's encouraging. I appreciate that, man. I appreciate that. Thank you. One of the things that I say say about you, is as busy as your schedule is and as many things that you're responsible for. Um, there's a a Tupac song or hook that when he says, I'll drop it off for y'all mm. when my homies call. Yeah. Mm. And that that definitely like describes you, right? Because not only for me, but so many people in your circle, I see when something happens, like you right there, yeah. right? Like we've spent times in yeah. the little lobby because yeah. I don't like sitting in the hospital room mm-hmm. when you when you would come and visit, you know what I mean? And yeah. it means a lot, you know what I mean? So I know that you live, this is who you are, not just what you do. Yeah. So I appreciate yeah, it, you. It's, it's people, what they call it, they say, uh, you outside, and I think that's what the Yeah, the term is, you outside. Yeah, I don't I'm know like, what it means, though. Yeah, but basically, you mean, you know, you can, you down for whatever, you out here, you know? Okay. And one kid was like, Yo, hang around, young and bro. <laughs> one kid was like, Mr. Wilson, you outside? Because someone had uh, tried to uh, actually stole one of our friends, uh, Ron's car. Oh. You know, or something. No, they kind of like put a gun on, put a gun on him or something. Yeah. Oh. In his driveway and took the car, something like that. And I came right over there fast. Yeah. And I told one of them, I was like, that's my friend. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so if you live, again, from what you do instead of who you are, I couldn't have responded in love. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's no way I'm gonna leave him like that, or even a situation mm-hmm. with Wabati. I'm like, yeah. you my friend, and that's my one of my students, that's you right. know. So I want to be there to support. Yeah. I, I'm not gonna do nothing stupid, you know what I mean? But I'm not gonna ever leave people who've been there for me just because I have a an image now, you know what I mean? It's like, no, nah, that's that's something everyone else benefits from, you know. Uh, God benefits from me being a servant, yeah. you know, and that's making yourself available when needed. Yeah, all right. All right. That's it. Speak for yourself. Jason Wilson, Ken Elkins, Dewan Dandridge. Peace. Peace. Calling all cyclists. We're talking about the two-wheel pedal pushers that love a good long ride. It's the Ride for Equity kickoff from Detroit to Ferndale and back. It's the first leg of a seven-day ride from Detroit to Mackinac. It all starts on May 21st at 8 a.m. Get your bike ready for the big ride for equity kickoff. Starting at Mary Grove College and rolling into Ferndale on May 21st starting at 8 a.m. To register, go to bldrideforequity.org. This ride is to raise funds for black entrepreneurs and bring awareness to the importance of equity funding practices. It's seven days of biking from Detroit to Mackinac, and it all starts at the Big Ride for Equity kickoff from Detroit to Ferndale, May 21st at 8 a.m. on the campus of Mary Grove College. Go to bldrideforequity.org to register. Are you ready to ride?